Welcome to Chartwell Chats, a series of discussions over two years with leading historians and experts, which explores Sir Winston Churchill's relationship with Chartwell, not only through the property's collections, but also through historic moments in time. Chartwell Chats was developed and is jointly presented by the National Trust Chartwell and the International Churchill Society UK. We're working together to preserve the historic legacy of Sir Winston Churchill. We hope you enjoy it. Hello, I'm Catherine Carter, curator of Chartwell, and you're joining us here for the third in our series of Chartwell Chats, where rather unusually you're joining us here in the kitchen. And the reason for that is we are joined by Dr. Annie Gray. Annie is Britain's favourite food historian and is an author, broadcaster and consultant, specialising in food from 1600 to the present day. Annie has written numerous books, including The Greedy Queen, the official Downton Abbey cookbook, and what brings her here today, Victory in the Kitchen, the life of Churchill's cook. So, first of all, big welcome, Annie. Welcome back to Chartwell, in fact, because you've been here as part of your research. Yes, I came here a couple of times. It was uh, towards the end of researching because I wanted to save it as a bit of a treat for myself. It was really nice to just come here, see the kitchen that Georgina would have worked in, see the dining room where her food would have been served. And of course, just to soak up the atmosphere of somewhere that's really quite unique in terms of studying Winston Churchill and Clementine. Well, of course, we are going to get onto the Churchills and their love of the cuisine that was created in this room. But first of all, how did you get into food history as a subject? Well, uh, I did modern history as an undergraduate degree and I found it interesting from a history point of view, but a bit of a turn off from a subject matter point of view. It's very much great white men striding the earth, hitting things. Uh, so I left and then I ended up doing a master's in historical archaeology, which is the archaeology of the period after, depending on who you ask, 1450 or 1600, much more about tangible objects, lives lived and also disenfranchised groups. So women, people of colour, that kind of thing. And I loved it because you could handle objects, you could walk through country houses, you could walk through townscapes and look around you at lampposts and that was history. And I also knew I wanted to work with country houses and museums and the public. So for me, when I started studying that and then I discovered, of course, that food was a big part of that, it all just came together. I loved eating anyway and cooking. So the idea that I could research food, talk about food and reach everybody, everybody eats. So it's a really accessible topic. So that idea of bringing it all together, history, archaeology, food, tangible stuff that really struck a chord with me and I suppose after that I mean I went on I did a PhD I worked in costume for a long time as well I've done all sorts of things but always in food history and always really with an aim to reaching the wider public and so what was it then that brought you into the subject of the Churchill family and the food that was served here in this house it was quite a fortuitous thing really. I'd written one book on Queen Victoria which really was about Victorian food as much as it was about the Queen and I needed to come up with a topic for a second book so I went along to an archive in Oxford and I stood and I just sort of imbibed the atmosphere of lots of cookbooks and I pulled things off the shelf and I looked at them and I sought inspiration and nothing happened. And then I found Georgina Landemar's cookbook, uh, the one that she wrote, Recipes from Number 10, which was published in the 1950s. And I thought, gosh, how extraordinary. I never knew that Winston Churchill's cook wrote a cookbook, but <laughs> come on, that's really obvious. Loads of people must have written about her and about the Churchill's food. So this is just such an obvious thing. So I put it on the shelf and I went away. And then about seven hours later, I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought, I bet no one has. And I got up and I looked it up on the internet and no one had really written about Georgina. There's a book on Churchill's food, but it's, it's not quite the same kind of topic. And I just thought, oh my God, this is amazing. This is a woman who cooked her entire way through the 20th century, worked for one of the most important figures of the 20th century in Western history. I can write about 20th century food. I can write about domestic service. I can potentially shed new light on the Churchill family. And this is a woman whose story deserves to be told. And fortuitously, Georgina's granddaughter was and is still alive. So I had a family connection. So I sort of did some scoping, realized it was going to be possible to write about her. And the more I researched and the more I thought about it, the more I became convinced this was a story that really did need to be told. And I have to say, I'm so glad that you're the one who told it because I absolutely love 
Victory in the Kitchen. I had the pleasure of reviewing it for Finest Hour magazine and I just remember feeling really hungry throughout. <laughs> yeah, that's it's... my entire life really. Um... <laughs> no, it is fantastic. So how then did you use the story of a member of the staff here at Chartwell? How does that then extrapolate into the story of life in this building? I think one of the mistakes people often make when they walk around any country house, not just Chartwell, but, but you can name it, I mean, there's, there's so many stately homes in Britain, is they walk around it and they focus very narrowly on the family that lived there. So we are all used to walking around state rooms or here walking around studies, bedrooms, libraries, really focusing on the people who owned the house. And it's a really unfair way to look at any large house, whether it's a country house or whether it's a town house, because the majority of people that lived here were servants. You have Winston Churchill, Clementine Churchill, Mary, then you've got various cousins and, and a sort of liminal set of people who are governesses, secretary. But then you've got this huge staff, eight, nine people, plus outside staff. And it's very easy to, to, to walk into the kitchen and then walk out again, but you've never really got a, a sense of the way the house worked. So for me, this was about putting a really important group of people who lived here, who worked here, who loved here, who, who, who ate, slept, you know, did everything. They were just missing from the whole narrative. So I thought this was a really good, a good way to put those people back into the story of the household, not the family, but the wider household, which always encompassed a lot more people than just those members of, of the family that were actually related to the Churchills by blood. I couldn't agree more. I think it's so fascinating to explore the lives of those people whose lives orbited around these houses, weren't necessarily the families of them, but nonetheless were so deeply rooted in them and are so important to their story. I wonder if you might be happy to paint a picture of what Chartwell was like maybe before Georgina got here. What was the sort of domestic setup? Who was who would have been occupying the space before she arrived? Well, I'd say the biggest word is probably rackety. Um, it the Churchills always spent more than they had, and Winston Churchill in particular was forever complaining about how poor he was. He was absolutely incapable of sticking to a budget. So you would have expected if you came here in the 1930s to find two or three members of staff, two most of the time, a cook, always a woman, and a kitchen maid. Now, the Churchills might have wanted to employ a male cook. Certainly they tried on a number of occasions to hire one, uh, but women were a lot cheaper. You would be paying a woman half the wage of a male cook. So someone of Churchill status, certainly between the wars, you wouldn't expect to find a male cook in the kitchen. So you've got a woman, always known as Mrs, regardless of marital status, because cooks were always given that honorary title, and then a kitchen maid as well. And Clementine Churchill talked quite a lot about the problem of finding decent cooks, because they could not pay good wages. So they were forever finding fairly young girls in their late teens or perhaps early 20s who really hadn't worked in very many places before. I mean, Clementine would train them up. Well, the problem with doing that is, of course, they then left. Um, so she was, she went, they went through cooks like a dose of the salt. There was a different cook every single year. And it was difficult to work here as well. It, this is a fairly standard kitchen for the 1930s. It was a reasonably modern house. Conditions were fine in terms of working. But Clementine and Winston were really difficult to work for. He was very irascible. He's notorious for all sorts of escapades, running around the house naked, shouting at people, being just a very difficult man. She was very highly strung. She also really, really knew her way around a kitchen and a menu book. So she was very exacting with these, these girls that really didn't know necessarily how to cook. So it was a very tense place to work. Um, I mean, even when you look at the way in which the Churchills refer to their servants in their own letters to and from each other, they do regard them as, as really as sort of figures of fun. And they'll talk about their servants as the tall one or the other kitchen maid. It's not a very comfortable thing to read from a modern perspective because they do depersonalise people. So working here in the 30s would have been fine from a technical point of view, but very, very difficult on a personal level. So what then changes? When, when Georgina and Chartwell intersect, if you will. So one of the things the Churchills did was they put on dinners, very, very important dinners. And, and Winston Churchill was very, very cognizant of the fact that a good dinner would bring people together and help him to negotiate his way through the political landscape that he was inhabiting at the time. And he and Clementine wrote to each other a lot about these dinners they were going to put on. He would say, I think we need to put on dinners and lunches with 
eight or ten invitees and they need to be good. And of course people needed to come together to talk. They also put on quite a lot of parties, garden parties, and because of the children there were things like coming of age parties and things like that. A lot of the time they hosted in hotels because that was a reasonably sort of cheap means of, of uh, entertaining people. But when they entertained here, what they would do is they would rent a cook. Uh, it's one of those other aspects of, of 1930s life that people don't tend to consider is the fact that it was just as easy then to hire a caterer as it is now. So they would hire in the leading London firms, people like Gunters, but they would also rent cooks for the weekend. So they would hire in uh, society chefs, shall we say, people like Georgina Landemar who were working as independent chefs on short-term contracts. She first cooked for them in 1933, just for a day. And you can see her crop up both in the menu books, in Clementine's diaries, and through her own writing, probably 10 to 12 times from 1933 through to about 1938. So she would come in, she would cook for particularly important dinners, and then she would leave again, leaving them to the kind of vagaries of their normal chefs or cooks, I suppose they really are. And what sort of a, a brief would she have been set? I mean, presumably very much bespoke for the individuals who are coming for a particular occasion. Yes, very much. So she cooked vegetarian food from time to time. She would sometimes cook things that particular guests liked. But by and large, her brief was cook really good food, cook really good French food, because that was the desirable food at the time. She had been, she was born in the 1880s uh, and she grew up, she worked in very big kitchens, so she's relatively unusual for a girl of that time. She started work when she was 13 and she only ever worked in households where there were at least five people in the kitchen, which is vanishingly rare. So she'd had a very good training herself. She married a French chef, Paul Landemar, who was the age of her father, um, and he had predeceased her, so he died in 1932. But the point was that by working alongside him, and they worked together as jobbing caterers, she was able to gain access to a whole range of dishes and a whole range of experiences that she would not otherwise have had. So she was a very, very good cook who had absolutely impeccable credentials, working at very high level with a man who had cooked for dukes, who had cooked in leading London hotels. And when she set up on her own in 1932, after Paul's death, it was in that milieu. It's very much, I will cook you extraordinarily good French food, which is what everybody sought, what everybody was used to, but I will do it in the modern fashion. We have, or rather her cookbook still exists, her manuscript cookbook in which she wrote all of her recipes. So you can get a really good snapshot of the kind of food she was cooking. And we have some of the menus from Chartwell as well, from some of the food that she was cooking here. So you can see that it is very much what I would call absolutely stereotypical 1930s high-end food. Perfect, beautiful, seasonal stuff, relatively unusual for people of Churchill's calibre to necessarily eat seasonally. And when you cook her dishes, when you actually work from her recipes, the food is exquisite. Have you recreated a lot of them? I have cooked quite a lot of Georgina's recipes. So when I wrote the book, I decided I was going to eat largely 1930s food for about two months. Uh, it was joyful. I mean, I did put on a little bit of weight because there was quite a lot of pudding involved. But I have to say, Georgina's recipes are fabulous. There is a bacon and cheese flan that she does which is just, I mean, it's unbelievable. It has entered my, my sort of general recipe kind of rosita now, so every time I get a chance to cook it, that's, that's it. There is no other bacon and cheese, all other. Quiche Lorraine, any form of other flan, it's dead to me. It's just Georgina's. It is so good. Is there a flavour in there as well, forgive the pun, um, of what Winston is requesting most, what Clementine's requesting most? What are their favourites? What are the go-tos? There isn't... It's hard to say because it, the, the menu books are so fragmentary. So the one that, that predates, the only one that predates the war in the Churchill archive dates to 1936-37. And it is frustrating because those menu books would have been kept for every day of the year. And when the archive was organised, donated, at that point in time, nobody valued domestic servants. Nobody valued the kind of household daily life. So whether they were lost well before that or whether it was just that they weren't thought to be important and therefore they were junked. For me as a researcher, finding copies of Churchill's speeches in triplicate but no menu books was incredibly frustrating. But times of course have moved on and we now value social history much more. There are repeated dishes. 
So Boodle's Orange Fool crops up uh, five and a half times, the half being one that's in there and then cross out. Uh, I think Irish stew's in there three times. Uh, there's a chicken soup every single day, which very much um, works with the fact that Churchill himself wrote to his doctors. They prescribed him various dietaries in the 1930s because he put on weight and he had indigestion and he went back and forth getting second opinions because he didn't really want to have to give up port or anything like that. So he kind of wiggled his way around them but he did say at one point I'm very proud of myself because I am eating chicken soup I know you recommended vegetables but I don't like vegetables so I'm going to eat chicken soup so chicken soup does appear nearly every single day there's a lot of roast meat a lot of roast chicken which was at that point still quite an expensive meat today we think of chicken as quite cheap but then it wasn't roast beef appears an awful lot as well so every Sunday there is a roast still uh, and vegetables which are very clearly from the gardens here at Chartwell they are quite monotonous um, they very much fit the pattern that you would expect of soup and a fish and then something very meaty, some vegetables and a very plain dessert. But uh, there's no clear favourites. I think it's more, you can see Clementine trying to experiment. So she does put things like, like you know, poise à la condé um, until she puts the reference in there. And yeah, there is, a, there is a sense of plain, fairly boring food which is then zhuzhed up with French stuff. But of course, that's also only a snapshot. That's only what was being he eaten here, cooked by one cook. And we do know that both Winston and Clementine Churchill ate out a lot and that Churchill pretty much propped up the Savoy at one point. So, you know, that's the stuff they're eating here. On a, on a much wider basis, there's an awful lot of very high-end food being consumed. So when does it change? When does it go from Georgina as someone who's parachuted in to help with specific occasions to her being part of the, the household staff day in, day out? Well, it's the war. Uh, so Georgina must have known as, as 1939 sort of rolled on and, and rumblings of war became obvious in Europe, she must have felt a, a certain sense of foreboding. She'd already worked through one world war. She already knew that all of her clients, all of the aristocracy that she worked for, they would flee largely to London hotels, their houses would be shut up. Her, her whole client base was gonna stop. So she must have been thinking, okay, what am I going to do? I mean, she was in her 50s. She still had loads of life in front of her. She certainly wasn't ready to retire. The cook at Morpeth Mansions, who was a similar age, did retire. She went off to go and live in Reading with her daughter. But Georgina was not that kind of person. So she must have looked around and thought, okay, you know, I need someone I can go and work for who's going to be still employing people for the war and, and, and if you looked around at that point you'd be going hedging your bets she had a very wide circle of people she'd worked for people like Ian Hamilton um, Lord Londonderry uh, various barons as well but none of them were kind of at the forefront and I suspect she thought to herself okay this guy this guy's going places I've worked for them I know I can cope with him and a lot of other people can't and I know they can't afford me so if I offer my services to them at a reduced wage, I reckon they're going to snap me up. So that's what she did. She wrote to Clementine Churchill and Clementine Churchill later wrote the foreword to Georgina's recipe book and said when she offered her services to me, I knew that she would be able to make the most of the ration and that everyone, everyone, would be happy. So she had an interview with her, that's in Clementine's engagement diary, and then she started work for them in January 1940, so just before rationing came in. Um, and that was it, she continued to work for them all the way through the war, and then afterwards she became their longest serving cook, they were also her, her longest employers to be fair, and she worked for them all the way through until 1955, so this was a really long period of time. So you mentioned about rationing as well, so how does that impact on what she's making for the Churchills? The ration was set, I mean, I think most people are aware of how the ration worked, but just to sort of reiterate, you, you were given an allowance of food, uh, you paid for that, obviously it wasn't just handed out to you, and the way it worked was that you would have a ration book with your ration, so two ounces of tea, for example, two ounces of butter, two ounces of margarine, two ounces of lard, meat was done by cost, because obviously a steak was a more desirable item than, say, lots of kidneys. Um, some things weren't on the ration, so fish wasn't rationed, potatoes weren't rationed, uh, bread wasn't rationed. And in a house like this, everybody would pool their ration books. So Georgina would have been handed a big pile of 12 ration books, which was the servants, the Churchills. And then it was up to her what she did with what she got. So she'd get 12 people's ration of margarine, 12 people's ration of butter, 12 people's ration of, of uh, meat. 
and she would cook for the whole household. She was cooking for the Churchills, but also for the servants. Then there were things outside the ration. So there were things on points. Uh, that was a system which came in in order to give the British public the illusion of choice. So they were given 24 points they could spend on things. Spam was on points. Uh, powdered egg, which is revolting, was on points. Then there were things that kind of you would get not on the ration and it was totally fine, but there was a kind of grey area. So for example, if you and I were in 1942, and you happen to live in the countryside and you keep rabbits and you've got a great vegetable garden. I live in the town where I can occasionally maybe get an orange from a shop and I'm growing, I don't know, interesting vegetables in my tiny urban back garden. We might get together and swap. So I might send you an orange and you send me a rabbit. And that's also what happened here, or rather in London, in Downing Street, where they were living at the time. The difference is that you would be the king and I'm Winston Churchill. So instead of sending me a rabbit, you're going to send me a deer from Balmoral with labels on. And all those labels are still in the archive. So there's a lot of stuff that comes into the Churchill household that does not really fit most people's idea of what they were eating during the war. Meat was not a problem. Then there were gifts that were sent. So fresh eggs. I mean, fresh eggs weren't a massive problem anywhere because there were hens here at Chartwell and the kitchen garden here was kept going throughout the whole war. So uh, peaches and honey from the beehives and those kind of things were regularly going up. But there are instances of things like primary school children all sending the Churchill family their eggs because they kept hens in their school, all of them with their names written on the eggs. And then they would be given a book in return. So in some ways it's very, very sweet. But I suppose what I'm getting at is that for the Churchills, there the were issues with some supplies. And certainly, as Georgina said in a later interview, she, she had to be seen to be sticking to the ration. It had to be fair. And they did. They absolutely stuck to the letter of the law. But it is very different when you are an aristocrat and your friends are aristocrats in terms of what's being sent to you and what you're receiving. And then there were also diplomatic coupons. So for entertaining, there were extra allowances. And the government also paid for Winston's wine supply. So uh, there was never any shortage of booze either. And what would life have been like for Georgina at that point in Westminster at the height of war? How would that have been for her? Well, she later on said that it was her war work. So I think, I mean, she was used to cooking for people who were famous, who were powerful anyway. She always said that she, I think it was 14 monarchs she said that she'd cooked for, uh, because of course, you know, half of Europe ended up in London once they'd been displaced from their own thrones. Uh, and she took it very much in her stride. It's at that point, she's, she's quite a hard person to get to grips with for some of the earlier parts of her life, because working class women are very difficult to research, more so in some ways in the 20th century than they are for the 19th century, because the census data has not yet been released. And of course, because she was not uh, wealthy enough to vote, you don't, you can't trace her through the electoral registers for quite a long time. But once you hit the war and once you start to get this rash of autobiographies and memoirs that were published later on, nearly everybody who worked for the Churchill household or interacted with it in any way mentioned Georgina. So it was very clear that by 1942 even she'd become really an integral member of the household, really valued, really valued as an amazing cook and also as somebody who was short and rotund and a bit of a gossip. She knew all of the ways of the aristocracy, apparently, and she was also quite into horse racing. Uh, so um, she would read, I mean, after the war, this is, she would read the horse racing news and sit there with her feet sort of propped up on the oven, filling in the betting form while she had things stewing away. She was absolutely unflustered. And it was really hard to her because Churchill, of course, changed his mind like the wind, not about what he was eating, but where he was eating. He was addicted to Downing Street. He couldn't get away from the place. Even though they were in the annex, he, was, he wanted to eat in Downing Street. It's the seat of power, God damn it. He really worked hard to get there. So they had a, a dining room sort of constructed in one of the underneath, the, one of the basement offices. It's now the typist's pool. And this thing was um, armoured and, and Clementine sort of worked her magic with flowers and, and paint schemes. So it didn't feel like they were underground in a bunker. But Churchill would suddenly decide that they weren't going to eat in the dining room in the annex that night. They were going to eat in Downing Street after all. And of course, Georgina cooking in the annex would have all these stews ready and the, these sort of puddings and things. So they'd have to drive from the annex to Downing Street. It's about 
10 metres, but you've got all this stuff, all these things wrapped in shawls. So they're all cuddling these sort of cauldrons of things as they drive it over to Downing Street. So she can go into the kitchen there and start going. And she kept on cooking as well in the kitchen at Downing Street. She was cooking there when the bomb fell in 19, at the end of 1940. Um, and and it, it, you've got this constant risk of bombs falling and things cooking and people having to move and not being able to get hold of ingredients necessarily. And, oh, suddenly somebody else is coming to dinner. And But she just took it all in her stride and just turned out good food. Oh, the king's coming for dinner today. Oh, oh OK, that's not a problem. Uh, actually, at Downing Street, they're really practicing very, very stringent rationing and being seen to do it. Food at Downing Street's terrible. So what can we cook? Something great. King liked coming to Downing Street a lot. So those are the war years, of course, like you said, doing her war work with the Churchills. But her relationship with them doesn't end when, when victory is declared. What is that next chapter for her? No, it doesn't. Victory is declared and, um, and one of the really most touching stories actually, it's in the book but it's also in one of the, the various memoirs, is that on VE Day, Georgina was cooking obviously, um, and she nearly missed the whole speech thing. She was there with her puddings and, and someone said, come on, come on. So she comes upstairs and, and she's standing at the, the back of the crowd in the, in the room where he's giving a speech out on the balcony. And apparently he turned as he came out on the balcony, broke away from the group around him, rushed over to her and just said to her, I could not have done this without you. And for that, I mean, no wonder she was incredibly loyal afterwards, because it's the kind of thing a cook really wants to hear. This is totally behind the scenes. She never wanted fame or fortune or anything else. But I think it gave her a huge confidence to know that she'd gone through the war years with this, this figure who by then was becoming legendary. So she stayed with the family. Um, the only other servant who'd seen them through that whole time, Frank Sawyer's uh, Churchill's valet, he left. So she was the only one left. And she became this kind of, almost like a matriarch. She was certainly quite a legend herself in that lots of people would come and they would come down to the kitchens to just, just talk to her. I mean, a lot of the people that came to dinner after the war, up at Hyde Park Gate in particular, had employed Georgina themselves as a jobbing cook between the wars. Uh, so they knew her anyway, but they'd all pop down and she was known as Mrs. Ma. And she became this, this real part of the household. It was just unthinkable that they would have known Clementine Churchill. Of course sure she was. Um, and yeah, she's part of the family. She is, however, by that point, growing older. Um, she was very, very stout by that point. Later on, she got a diagnosis of diverticulosis. So it's quite a painful condition. Um, and she, she kind of... She, she, she doesn't start to retire, but you can certainly see her step back a bit. She's much more confident in her own skin. She writes letters to the Times. She's sort of become, become that person. Um, and she's very, very well respected. But eventually she becomes too ill to continue. So she's, she's really starting to suffer by sort of 1953, 1954. So she starts to take a step back. Um, she tries to retire. It doesn't take because it turns out that the cook who replaces her puts Bovril in the gravy. Ooh, yeah, not good. Uh, so she comes back and then she goes away again and then she comes back again and she goes away again. And she wrote herself about how great it was as well when, when Churchill got re-elected in, in the 1950s. So, oh, wasn't it brilliant to come back and be welcomed? Oh, here you are, Mrs. Ma. It's that level. Uh, anyway, eventually she was forced to retire. Although she did come back yet again to cook a birthday dinner. So it wasn't until 1955 that she finally retired. Uh, and she lived till 1978, so long retirement, and stayed friends in as far as their relevant social status would permit with Clementine Churchill. They used to meet up, uh, Clementine used to go over and have chocolate cake with Georgina in the flat that she lived in above her daughter's garage, cook chocolate cake for her. Uh, it was actually, it's a really nice relationship. There's a real sense of, of, of genuine companionship. Because I remember speaking to one of Churchill's granddaughters, and she remembers being welcomed with these big bear hugs by Georgina. So that evolution from her sort of popping in every now and then as a VIP to being someone who's really, you know, quite embedded in the Churchill family. How would you describe that transition? Oh, she's absolutely the retainer. She's, she's, she is the, the kind of archetypal family retainer. And that wasn't that common, actually. I think we've got this idea of a kind of cosy English country house life. Certainly, overseas views of, of English country house life is, is cosy and nice and wasn't it all lovely and that's just 
not how it was, especially in the 1950s when a lot of people couldn't afford servants anymore and there's a real servant problem and people are, are replacing servants with things like electric cookers. Um, so, and lots of servants don't want to live in anymore. That's a really key thing. A lot of servants now live out and come in as a daily child. So to have someone living in who's part of that family is... It is quite rare and it is quite special in some ways. Mary Soames was taught to cook by Georgina um, and Georgina gave her a copy of one of her own cookery books, a, a patisserie book that was given to her by her husband. So there's a real link there. They, they swapped Christmas presents. The letters that Georgina wrote to Mary on the birth of her children genuinely are filled with emotion and they it's very clear they got on. One thing that's surprising with that in mind, given that we are here in the kitchen at Chartwell, this room, when it first opened in the 60s, was actually the shop. So mm. this is where you'd have bought your postcards or, or whatever you wanted to get. It wasn't shown as the kitchen. And it was only turned back into the kitchen. We're very lucky that most of the infrastructure had remained in place. But it was only the 1990s when the decision was made to move the shop elsewhere and show this as the kitchen. What do you think that that says about the understanding of, of the role of the people in this room up until recently? Well, I mean, it's very classical... National Trust, but also an, uh, what more widely the kind of museum theory is that until probably 30 years ago, we didn't really value domestic history as much as I think obviously we should have done. And I think it would have been pretty typical for a visitor to any country house in Britain to exit via the kitchen shop. And an awful lot of kitchens are still, they're not so much shops now, they're normally tea rooms because it feels very useful and kind of act increasingly kitchens are being reopened uh, we're not there yet uh, at the moment tea rooms are moving into stables until such time as we realize horses are really interesting and then start opening them i think for a long time domestic service was really not valued certainly by the time we got to the 1960s and 1970s there were a lot of people the, the generation that was leading the charge at that point their parents and their grandparents had been in domestic service and domestic service was something people didn't really want to dwell on. It was somehow shameful to have had a parent or a grandparent who worked as a servant. Servants were not valuable. Um, Georgina had this with her own daughter, which she started to write a memoir. And it was a horrible, horrible time in their lives. I mean, there was, I think her daughter was about to be diagnosed with breast cancer and um, the, her son-in-law was also very ill. And she started to write a memoir and her daughter said nobody would value her life. What was the point? She was domestic service. So she ripped it up and pushed it down the plug hole. And there are 19 pages that survive, and they're just everything. Um, but I think there was this kind of idea that service, servants, domestic life was not valuable. And also it was very close to us. Most people in the 1970s, 1980s, were used to kitchens like this at one remove because that's where their parents might have worked. And, and quite often they'd grown up somewhere like this as well. And then I think what happened was in the 90s, generational change had happened and people became much more interested in the lives of their own ancestors. But also within museums culture, we started, I think, to realise that this reverence for the family and not for the wider household, not an interest in the wider household, was misplaced. That the idea that we should all be somehow, oh, the aristocrats, that's everything. We should all be forelock-tugging and, and, and really reverential towards anyone with a title. All of that went out the window. And that's just social change. So as kitchens started to open, of course, it's very chicken and egg. Visitors went, oh, I really like this. And I've worked in kitchens, not dissimilar to this one, as a room steward, where you watch people and they go round the house, and they look at all the fine silks and the beds, and they just don't get it. They go, oh, well, I, I don't, you know, this is all nice to look at. And you watch them come into the kitchen and their shoulders go down and they take a big deep breath and usually they'll say something like, this is where I'd have been. And you have to say, well, not necessarily because it's quite rare to work in a really big household. And they go, really? And it's brilliant because then you have a conversation about domestic service and about the fact that domestic service is the history of women. And that's another thing that I think is really important and another good reason to have kitchen spaces like this open. It, it was the single biggest employer of women from the 19th century on to the 20th century. You cannot talk about the history of women without talking about domestic service. And you can't talk about domestic service without talking about women. And whenever someone says, oh yes, but servants, you know, they didn't have any agency or, or they were just treated really badly. I want to say, but it, there are so many people in that area that would be like saying all office workers hate their jobs. Now, some do, 
and some are treated badly and some are horrible bosses and some love it and they work their way up the career ladder and some have flexibility and some don't. You know, it, it's that level. So to see spaces open, to see people react to those spaces and then to see those spaces reinterpreted and then people react to the reinterpreted, it's, it's very much about give and take. And I think it's also about the museum's culture listening much more to the members of the public. We're no longer going, wow, we can go around a country house. We've never been able to do that before. We're going, oh, we've been around country houses so many times. I actually want to know how this worked. I'm interested, really interested in the lives of everybody, not just the privileged few at the top. And I think it's brilliant that the scholarship as well is, is reflecting that. And that's exactly what you've done with Victory in the Kitchen, which really is a, a fantastic read. I can't recommend it highly enough. If you had to distill down the difference that Georgina Landemar made to the Churchill family's lives, what would you say? I would say she was an enabler. People talk about Winston Churchill as being a great man. They talk about the Churchill family as being great. But I would say it's very easy to be great, or at least a lot easier to be great, if you've got someone really skilled behind you doing your daily tasks. And of course, the Churchills had a huge staff. Everyone from secretaries to drivers to, to, to cleaners to all the rest of it. But I think having a really skilled cook when you are doing so much diplomacy through dinner was absolutely crucial to Winston Churchill, especially in those war years. You know, his table was renowned for being one of the best going, and it certainly was a draw. And of course, enabled him, who was notoriously interested in food, to work his way through as well. So I would say, you know, I'm with Winston Churchill on this one. He could not have done it without her. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Annie. It's been an absolute pleasure.